All right, so uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about um, earthquake forecasting rather than predictions. It's, uh, we don't like to use the P word so much anymore. As uh, Sue was saying, prediction is tarnished now, and it's currently not possible. But we do know a lot about um, how the probabilities of earthquakes change in time and space. Um, oh my goodness, this is going to be really annoying having to do this. Um, so I'm going to very quickly teach you the basics of um, earthquake forecasting from a statistical seismology perspective. And then I'm going to contrast that to the way we approach it from geology. And then I'm going to show a new method where we're basically combining the two different approaches to get um, better predictions, better forecasts. Um, so there's a number of uh, important scaling laws that uh, go into um, earthquake forecasting. Um, the big one you probably all have heard of is um, the gutenberg richter magnitude scaling. This is um, it's basically the, uh, oh geez, um, the, um, the number of earthquakes um, scales with magnitude as an exponential or with energy as a power law. This um, x-axis here is basically a log scale of energy. Um, so what that means is there's tons of little earthquakes and very few big earthquakes. And as you go up a unit in magnitude, you have 10 fewer um, 10 times fewer earthquakes. So there's, for every magnitude 7, there's 10 magnitude 6s, 100 magnitude 5s, and so on. The little ones really um, drown out the big ones in terms of signal. Um, the next most important scaling law is um, what's called Omori decay. This is showing how the rate of aftershocks decay in time. So when earthquake occurs, it uh, typically triggers aftershocks. You get a lot of aftershocks immediately after the earthquake, and then they decay with time from the from the time of the first earthquake. And that follows um, a power law decay. The exponent is about 1. So that means if you have, say, um, 100 earthquakes the first day, the next day you'll have 50, the next day you'll have about 30 or so, and so on. Um, big earthquakes trigger more aftershocks than smaller earthquakes. And it's about a factor of 10 for each uh, magnitude unit. So magnitude 7 is going to trigger 10 times the earthquakes as a magnitude 6. Magnitude 7 can trigger 100 times earthquakes as a magnitude 5, and so on. So not only are big earthquakes more damaging um, because they, they release more seismic energy, they also are more damaging in terms of the aftershocks they can potentially produce. And finally, um, aftershock rates decay away following a parallel with distance from the main shock. So you have a lot of aftershocks right near the main shock, but you also get them further away, but at smaller and smaller densities as you move away from the parent earthquake. So you can see all of these scaling laws um, very easily if you just look at maps and figures of aftershock sequences around the world. This is just an example showing uh, the magnitude 8.8 earthquake that hit along the seduction zone in Chile in 2010. The top is a map of the aftershocks. This bottom is a figure. This is, um, I've scaled the circles to go with about basically the amount of fault area that ruptured in each earthquake. So this is basically the area of that main shock. And then all the little circles are showing in linear time all of the aftershocks, colored by how big they are. And you can see that um, aftershocks decay in time. So you get a lot of aftershocks immediately following the main shock, and then they peter out. You can see just by looking that they decay in space. You can see on the top plot how right along the fault area of this rupture, you get a very dense amount of aftershocks. But you also get a few that are further away. Um, Secondary triggering, you can see on this plot, whenever, because uh, all aftershocks can potentially trigger aftershocks, but bigger earthquakes trigger more, you can often see following large aftershocks that you get more secondary triggering. So whenever there's a particularly large aftershock in the sequence, those in turn will trigger aftershocks, and you get a brief pickup in the aftershock rate. Were there really nothing before that big uh, at main shock, or is that just a That's my plot. There may, I think there probably were four shocks. Most earthquakes have four shocks. Yeah, that's my plotting. That's a good point. And I'll, I'll get to four shocks later, because that's the name of the game for increasing our ability to forecast uh, how the probabilities change. Um, another thing is that the size distribution is constant. This is something a lot of people don't realize. People think that as you get further out in the aftershock sequences, the aftershocks get smaller. No, the aftershocks just get reduced in number, so the rate goes down. But any given one of those earthquakes that's triggered has the same probability of being big or large. They all follow that Gutenberg-Richter scaling relationship. Whether they're aftershocks, whether they're main shocks, it doesn't seem to matter very much. You still have most of the earthquakes are small, 
a small proportion or less. But as you get further out in the aftershock sequence, there are just fewer rolls of the dice. Probability of a big number, a big magnitude, is the same. So we can combine all of these rules um, into something called an epidemic type aftershock sequence models. This is modeling earthquakes as an epidemic, sort of as a contagion. One earthquake can trigger more. Those earthquakes in turn can trigger more, like how a disease spreads through a population. And um, this modeling is uh, the basis of our most successful earthquake forecasting methods to date. It's not everything that's going on in earthquakes because there's really no physics in it. Um, but you can get basically, you know, 95% say of the signal in catalogs. You can reproduce it with these kinds of uh, these types of models. So all earthquakes can trigger aftershocks. Big earthquakes trigger more. When we run these aftershocks, we do multiple generations. So that earthquake can trigger more. Each of those earthquakes can have its own daughter quakes, and so on and so forth. You can have, you know, you can go 10 generations out um, until until finally, just uh, stochastically you have an earthquake that doesn't trigger something. There's a small chance that any earthquake can trigger an aftershock bigger than itself. It's typically about 5%. And that's independent of the main shock magnitude. So this is something we, people are always asking us when an earthquake happens. Um, the press always comes to us, what's the chance it's going to trigger something even bigger? And we can always try to say it's about 5%. Um, and that's the, that's the chance it'll happen within, within a week or so. Um, and then it, it decays as you get further out. So, just be, so a, a given foreshock, this is a chance of a, a small, this is showing an example of a small earthquake, this foreshock. It was one in the 5%, and it happened to trigger something bigger, which after the fact, we call that bigger earthquake a main shock. But before it happened, we didn't know that that small earthquake was a foreshock. So really, the naming is more something we can do after the fact. But all the statistical laws, those scaling relationships I showed you, make no distinction between foreshocks, aftershocks, and main shocks. A foreshock is a main shock in a sense that just happened to trigger an aftershock that was bigger than itself. So everything I've told you so far um, just uses earthquake locations, times, times, and sizes. But I haven't said anything about faults. And faults should be important, right? Locations of earthquakes it turns out, don't tell us the whole story. So this is a map um, of all of the major mapped faults in California. It's not all the faults, because we don't know where all the faults are. We still have earthquakes that happen on faults we haven't mapped. But these are all the faults that are well characterized enough to be included in, um, in a model that I work on. Because they, and we know enough about how fast they move um, to basically see their effects and to map them. Um, these are colored by um, the fault slip rate. So the fastest moving faults in here are moving at about three to four centimeters per year. Um, and you can see, if you know where it is, the San Andreas is that orangish yellowish line cutting through the middle. Um, and it's, uh, it, that system is one of the fastest moving um, faults in the state, is the fastest moving fault in the state. And um, what's interesting is that if you just looked at where all the earthquakes occur, Parts of this fault would not be readily apparent. For example, the Mojave, um, this, this, uh, this section here on the San Andreas and up in the Carrizo here on the San Andreas, there's almost no earthquakes there. So we can't just include earthquakes and stop there in our models because there are these hazardous faults that are moving and eventually that energy has to be released. So I'm now going to talk about a different way to approach earthquake forecasting. And this is more of an approach from the geology side of things. So geologists go out, they map faults, they determine how quickly they're moving, and they can often dig up faults and find evidence of um, prehistoric ruptures to fill in our knowledge before we had um, instruments, before we have historical records. Um, this is showing a map of Japan, and this is how, in their model, they've, um, they've constructed a hazard model starting from the faults. So instead of starting from earthquake locations, small earthquake locations starts from the faults, so sort of from the other end. And they've divided up these faults into um, various segments based on geometrical reasons they think that, the, that a rupture might stop and based on past earthquakes. So in pa past earthquakes along, along the subduction zone, how big were they? So this is what the, um, the other model looked like um, a few years ago, before 2010, before, or 2011, before the big magnitude 9 earthquake that struck. So this is a... Uh, this is the area of the fault that ruptured in the 2011 magnitude 9 Tohoku earthquake. This is the one that caused the 
terrible tsunami and damaged the uh, nuclear power plant near Fukushima. Um, and as you can see, this, this fault, uh, this rupture, blew past the boundaries that they had drawn beforehand on their seismic hazard maps. So the earthquake that happened wasn't segmented in the simple way that had been drawn. And it formed an earthquake that was much larger than would happen if each of those little individual segments along the fault had ruptured by themselves. So what we're trying to do in California is um, avoid those kind of mistakes of assuming that faults can only rupture in simple, segmented, characteristic ways. And so we're trying to um, put together these epidemic types of forecasting models with the fault-based information, because we think both are important. It's important to know where the faults are, particularly because they're not all lit up by, by seismicity that we capture on our network. But it's also important to include earthquake triggering and include the stranger earthquakes, these are hoku type events that you don't get if you just divide up your fault zones into a few possible earthquake sources. One thing we've discovered by building this model is that if you make a kind of model like we had in Japan, and we had these same types of models in California, I'm not just saying just Japan did it. We had these segmented models in California as well in the past. What we found is that these models are not consistent with Gutenberg-Richter and magnitude scaling relationships. So in Gutenberg-Richter and magnitude scaling relationships, you have these very rare, very big events. This is just what we've recorded, but this doesn't stop. It keeps going, at least up to the lower magnitude eights in California. So to combine our known statistical laws with faults, we have to acknowledge that there are these weird, stranger quakes that can happen. And we've seen these again and again in the past. Um, this is, a, on the right, I have a picture of um, different faults that linked up in the 1992 Landers earthquake in Southern California. So we linked up four different faults. Previously, we didn't know that they could rupture together to make this, this uh, large earthquake. And if, they had, if these individual faults had just ruptured independently, say just the Johnson Valley Fault or just the Homestead Valley Fault, it wouldn't have made a big of magnitude earthquake as actually happened when they all linked up together. And there's many examples of, um, in recent times, of big earthquakes that have done this link up faults. Um, and the most recent example is this uh, Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand that happened uh, just last year, magnitude 7.8. And it, it just linked up all these different faults. Um, this is even a simplified map to some extent. I saw one presentation where they had mapped some 14 different fault strands that had all linked up. And because of this, because of these really weird earthquakes, this is a way to get um, if we include these types of earthquakes in the model, this is a way to satisfy the size constraints, that, that Gutenberg-Richter relationship that I was talking about earlier. So to combine statistical laws with faults, we have to acknowledge that these sort of weird earthquakes that, that we've seen are not really the exception. They're really the rule. And the better data that we have following large earthquake, the more and more we notice that this is what's really happening. Faults don't exist in isolation. They link up. They form an interactive network. In a dynamic sense, rupture on one little fault can trigger rupture on another fault. And it may not even make sense to even, I mean, we've gone through, we've mapped these faults, and we've given them different names. But in a sense, it's all a connected fault network. It may, it's sort of a construct that we've gone in and said, this is the San Andreas, and this fault is the San Jacinto. Well, there's a junction where they meet. So it's really sort of a branching structure, a connected network of faults. Furthermore, you can't just look at the length of a fault to determine the maximum possible earthquake. This is something we've done time and time again in California, is we've gone in and mapped a fault and say, oh, it's this long. That's the maximum size of earthquake that can occur. We're just asking Mother Nature to disprove us if we do that. So what we've been doing in California is running ETAS models on the fault network, but allowing the faults now to link up to form these stranger quakes, these multi-fault ruptures. This is shows, showing an example of a magnitude seven on the San Andreas Fault on the Mojave section in Southern California. We then run ETAS simulations. So at the top you can see the magnitude seven main shock and all the little aftershocks that it's triggered. This is one of the ETAS simulations where uh, 126 days later, a section further down in the San Andreas connected with um, faults through the Brawley seismic zone to make a 7.7 .7 aftershock maybe the new main shock in some terminology. And then and 249 days later, another aftershock occurred linking up um, faults in the Ventura Basin. This is the, basically the worst of our uh, 
one of, of 1,000 simulations that we ran. What we can do is run lots of different simulations and explore these possibilities. Most of the time, 95% of the time, that earthquake won't trigger something bigger. But of all the times it does, we can uh, model um, what those sequences look like and what their losses are. So this, just this is a loss exceedance curve. What this means is, for a given probability, the chance that the insured losses in the state will reach a certain amount. So there's a 1 in 100 chance in a typical year you're going to have a $30 billion loss. But not if you just had a magnitude 7 on the San Andreas. Then you look at the red curve. Now the chance of a $30 billion loss is about 1 in 10. So for insurance companies, they need to know this whole curve. We can't just model the mean, the most expected sequence. We have to model the, basically the worst thing that can happen, because they want to be sure that they have enough reinsurance that they can, they can be sure with, uh, say, a less than 1% probability they're going to go bankrupt. So they need to insure themselves against um, basically the tails of this distribution. So getting the tails right really matters. So just to conclude, to properly model earthquake sequences on faults, we have to model the rarest events. There is no one possible big one that we can forecast, we uh, predict. We can't really predict earthquakes in that way. But there are many possibilities for what that big one might be with varying probabilities and even possibilities of clusters of big ones. Thank you. OK, we're running a tiny bit behind schedule. That's my fault. Um, I, so we have time for like one question. Uh, Carlos? Yeah. Uh, two, uh, September, Mexico, there were two big earthquakes. Yeah. So there, there was 8.5 um, of the uh, coast of Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. And uh, like how many days? 10 days later, the days seven later. in Puebla. Yeah. yeah. Then I understand the first one was um, in a fault, and then the other one was in the plague. Or it's in, in, in the middle of the plague, so it's like not in the fault. Yeah. A lecture from the Geology Institute in, in Mexico was claimed that there's roughly the same probability of having interplay or intraplay earthquakes and also more or less of the same magnitude. But uh, I mean, there was a question whether there was a relationship between these two. Do you think there is? Yeah, I actually. When it first happened, I thought well, the 10 days apart, they're about three fault lengths apart. I thought for sure they're related. Um, but then I actually did the calculation because people were getting questions from the media, yep. and it was about a 50-50 chance. So it's not clear, but just based on all those scaling laws that I was showing you, you do get triggering out that far, about three fault lengths, but it's at a very low rate. But also the background rate is really low, yep. and so those numbers were about the same order of magnitude. So it could be triggered, could not be triggered. Um, a nice thing is that because it was very deep and being intraplate, it has a lower aftershock pr uh, productivity than earthquakes that are along, say, subduction zones. So that was one lucky thing was that it didn't have a very productive aftershock sequence.